Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Gray and this is another episode of the Gray Ave podcast. And today we have another exciting guest. And there's a lot of exciting things about this episode. Number one, I was using two of my new microphones that I recently purchased on Amazon. So the podcast quality is definitely going up. Second is that I have always been fascinated by magic for a number of reasons. And number one is that it goes on top of my head. Um, for someone like myself who does not believe in some kind of religion and anything that lacks evidence, but then I look at magic, it's happening in front of me and it's, it still drives me nuts. I still don't understand what's going on. And that's one of the reasons that um, I had to find a magician to talk to about this. And the second reason is I think that a lot of people are tricked into magic, into believing things or are controlled, you know, using fear by people who can actually perform magic. And by that, I mean, the good examples would be uh, psychics or pastors in church and things like or some kind of spiritual people. I think they can sort of do magic tricks that a magician also can do, but then they just don't call it magic. They would call it miracles or something mysterious. And, and that's my hi hypothesis. But I just didn't, didn't want to stay blind about it. That's why I had to find somebody who is knowledgeable in the subject. And Marcel was the perfect person for that. And why? Well, Marcel has over 20 years of experience uh, doing magic. He has been working in meetings, events, and conference industry as a specialist corporate entertainer and speaker. He is one of only a handful of presenters in the world who is able to provide a bespoke custom design presentation for conferences, gala, dinners, and corporate events. So that's exactly why I had to find Marcel to help me debunk this craziness of mine. And another thing worth mentioning is that Marcel has built a very exciting business or a marketing company around his abilities to do magic, which I think is totally incredible. He works with uh, corporates, as you already know by now, and he works with brands directly and by performing like magic on television and then bring in uh, a, a product for, to market it, which is totally exciting and out of the box to me. So I think that kind of concept can be applied to different niches. You might have something that you do. Uh, this is a good example of how you can turn, you can um, monetize your abilities. So he talks about that a little more in the podcast, but it was just something that I'm totally fascinated by. And one thing worth mentioning is that Marcel is actually the founder of Cape Town Magic Club in conjunction with sister clubs in New York, in London, where he hosts and headlines live magic shows. And there's more to that subject within the podcast. Marcel himself talk about that. I think that's it about me, live from Cape Town, South Africa. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and you might laugh to some of my uh, opinions. Please let me know in the comment box below or you can tweet, you can anything you want. Well, thank you. And here goes Marcel. Yeah, I'm Marcel Odians, a corporate magician and MC and founder and producer of the Cape Town Magic Club. Right. Okay, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> There's so many layers. The reason I came here, Marcel, is to understand what's going, what's going on be, uh, behind magic. Okay. Yeah. I, are you allowed to, to explain that? I can tell you as much as I can without revealing how the tricks work. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's exactly why I came here. Cool. Well, we're going to find out how far we can push that boundary. <laughs> okay. So before we get into like how you got started, yeah. uh, which I'm interested to, interested to know. Sure. Let's take me back. I was watching on TV, uh, I think a few years back. Yeah. You turned a hundred rand note in, into a ten rand and vice versa. Yes. On, tele, on ETV. Yes. Explain how that works. <laughs> well, let me put it to you this way. Um, when you watch a blockbuster movie and you're into the action and they've incorporated the CGI and mm. the music and the script and the acting all together... You want to be lost in a story and you want to experience the full story. What you don't want to know 
or see is suddenly halfway through the film they turn the cameras around and you see the director and the film crew and you see the the two you know the the main enemy and the main uh uh actor sort of uh having coffee together if you want to feel like this is in fact a story um and then afterwards you want to walk out with having this experience so how did i do it i used sleight of hand specifically mm. well that's like turning the camera around and, and ruining the story for you so i don't go into specifics other than to say that it's a it's a learned skill that um uses almost real-time cgi is the best way that i can sort of reveal the secret <laughs> look i watched that shot yeah you know many times yeah i could try to look at how close i could like to see exactly what's going on i couldn't yeah. see anything so, yeah and it was yeah. in front of the camera yeah and particularly when I do that for camera, I do that like they can zoom in right into my hands and you, you can't see anything. But then I've done it, you know, 10,000 times for a live audience, really like right next, standing right next to me. So by then I know exactly what I need to do for you to, for me to do the trick without you seeing how I did it. Okay. So this might be a little bit unrelated. Yeah. Uh, I was chatting, I was watching a... Uh, some magic on YouTube. Yeah. Then I was explaining to my friend, I was like, yeah. oh, have a look at this. And what he alluded to was like, ah, oh, look, man, there's some dark powers behind these things. So for somebody <laughs> like me, yeah. who is not religious at all, yeah. because it lacks proof to me, yes. right? when I look at things like magic, they actually spins my head around. Because yeah. I'm a type of person who likes to understand things, what's yes. really going on. Yes. So if something is happening in front of my eyes yeah. and I still don't understand it you know that drives me nuts oh yeah me, me too me. that's why that's why magic is my deep passion because I'm also from that um, school of thought where we need to have proof behind how mm. things work and so I think it was that same quest to find out how things work that got me interested into magic and then the art form of being able to take something that has a completely explainable method and it's really simple to understand the principles, not do, mind you, but to mm. understand the principles, um, and then to get people to look at it and try as hard as they can, they can't figure it out. So everything that I do has a complete logical explanation behind it. I mean, if I, it's something if I reveal to my colleagues or I work with other magicians, we share a process of making um, what is essentially theater look mm. like it's completely unprepared. It's a show. We, you know, like any stage show, like any theatre performance, there's things going on backstage. There's people checking out the lights, and there's directors giving script. And what I do as a magician, what magicians generally do, is to take away all those uh, extra things from the theatre. Take away the lights. Take away the directors. Take away anybody that helps, and create a piece of theatre as one person, so that people believe that what they see is true. Yeah. Here's the thing, though: just because you can't figure it out doesn't mean that there isn't a logical method. It just means you don't know what the logical method is. Right. But then what does that say to you about the human mind? Or what oh. are the things that we think we understand? Because yeah. that breaks that line to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what I think is the biggest appeal to magic is that we like to believe that we understand things around us. Mm. We like to believe that, that, we, that what we experience with our senses is true because we have experienced it with our senses. There's no other way to verify other than what we feel, yeah. essentially, or think, work out logically, mm. okay? Um, and so magic is the art form of kind of like, like a ninja. You sort mm. of creep into the process. You make people believe some parts of what you're saying, and you show them what they can see to be true, and yet in the background, you can't see what's going on. You can't experience what's happening backstage, basically, in the sight of hand version of things. You know? So what would be an example of the, uh, the human mind's fault, or like a, a glitch that, that you, oh, was, you as a magician... Right. Oh, oh, well, make it, take it bigger. The idea that you know, politicians are there out there to help people. Mm. You know, like... We want to believe that it's true, mm. and for the most part, we feel that you know uh, governments and politicians are looking after us. Yeah. But we never really go in depth into the process and into the system and understanding on the ground precisely how the system works. Mm. So we believe in the system as much as we can experience it, and as mm. from a m much information that we can uh, gather, 
but we never really understand what is going on there until we have that experience ourselves. All right, it's as if um, you suddenly saw the very first movie. Mm. You'd never seen a movie before, and suddenly yes. you see a movie, and you look at it and go, like, that must be um, something that's, uh, it must be real. Mm. It must be like, you know, like, let's say Godzilla as a movie, you know, if you've never seen a movie before and you see Godzilla, you go, well, everything I see is telling me that this is filmed and true, yeah. until you find out what the truth is. A good example of that is like, um, I think an 81-year-old um, grandmother of a friend of mine mm-hmm. poured a bucket of water onto the screen when she saw an explosion. Oh right, yeah, this is real. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so because that was her first time experience. Exactly. So um, magic plays in that edge of understanding out of the general population. Right. Right. Um, and I think the other key to it is that many, many people will watch and experience magic. Uh, I think a large group of them will try and think and solve how it works logically, mm. but you can't and because you're missing valuable and very important information about how the thing works. Yes. And out of those people that are trying to work it out, a very, very, very small percentage actually spend, invest the mm. energy and time and efforts to go and research and learn yeah. how the trick works. And then... Even then, once you've researched and maybe you've got instructions of how the trick works or a YouTube explanation, the fact is until you've performed that trick a thousand times, you will not personally understand why the audience might believe you when you perform that trick. Because yeah. that's the, like when I start learning a magic trick, a new trick to, to, to my repertoire, the first hundred times I'm doing it the way that I was taught to do it. Right. And then suddenly it comes to a point where I go like, ah, okay. In this moment, I can do this thing now, and mm. nobody's going to pick that up. In that moment, I can create a moment of wow and astonishment or great attention on something. So it's not just the research and the instructions. Mm. It's the application of the information regularly that allows you to understand how people, uh, what they want to believe, yeah. what they do believe, and what they have no idea exists for them to believe into. Right. Yeah, it's very deep. Then... Uh, it comes to another... Yeah, before we get into your story, I'm yeah, still yeah. trying to, yeah, yeah, to cool. break this down. <laughs> now, there are people who... There's church. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people who perform some kind of things that you um, average human beings wouldn't do. Yeah. And then people believe them and they, yeah. they, there's a church. So, is that related? What do you think of those things? Because I think, if I were you, I would yeah. have probably started a church and become a millionaire. <laughs> it's a big business. Well, it, it is. And if you watch South African news recently, yeah. you can hear that's happening. Um, yeah. So I think that the art of illusion and magic, uh, well, we know it's thousands of years old and has yes. been used for thousands of years. It was first documented like 4,000 years ago. So it has been used as a way to influence people for sure. Mm. And maybe initially it be- was more of a religious practice rather than an entertainment practice. Mm. Oh, but it? Well, I mean, pretty sure magic was used by, you know, so the, one of the first um, documented cases of, of magic is, um, uh, I got, can't remember his name, but he was an Egyptian ma- ma- magician and he would perform for the pharaoh and he would take a duck Mm. and to hold the duck's head and then rip the duck's head off Mm. and then show it around and then he would stick it back onto the duck and then the duck would walk away and he presented it as this illusion to the pharaoh as a sort of religious spiritual connotation when it is in fact just a simple well simple it's a it's an illusion it's a trick right yeah you said that's what drives me crazy again yeah sure and so well the reason why magic the art form of Mm. can be seen as something that is used in a spiritual manner is because it preys on the same it preys on the same uh, part of human thinking of the unbelievable and the not understood. Yes. Right. So you have an option when you're presenting somebody something that looks real that they don't understand mm. to either go, "I'm doing this for real," yeah. and I have superpowers. As and, and in in the art of magic, we call that mentalism, the, the power of the mind, magic. All right, or you can present it as the supernatural. I can make something appear. I can make something disappear. I have control of my environment. That's sort of more sleight of hand magic and illusion magic. Um, 
and then uh, you could also present it as something that I have power over you. So I can do this with your money. Mm-hmm. If you don't give me more money, I'll make the rest of your money b- disappear. disappear. And then we're talking about the using that that doubt yeah. and that confusion in a negative way to influence people. Right. So magic as entertainment uses magic the same principles that we would see when illusion is used in a spiritually influencing manner. It's the same principles but it's applied for humor for joy for surprise for creating wonder for creating amazement and that's why i play in the entertainment realm mm. um i also as uh, my style of magic my, my character side of magic is not to do things that necessarily do a lot of mental ability things mm. i want to show people something wondrous and entertaining and, and amazing so um i never really give an explanation of how it is that i'm doing these mm. things that i'm doing okay um, and if I'll directly, if somebody asks me, you know, are you using mind power, using magical powers? Have you got some special abilities? My answer is, well, no. The abilities I have is the ability of a, of a particular kind of theater yeah. and a presentational style and maybe some skill level in terms of knowing how to, you know, do something sneaky with a card or do something sneaky with money or do yeah. something sneaky with whatever prop I'm holding, okay? Those are sneaky things, those are th- those kinds of skills. Um, but I'm not using anything supernatural to do yeah. it. And I, my one of my missions as a magician is to show people who have the question of whether it is a spiritual thing to go, yeah. like, come on, this can't be real. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm joking with you. Yeah. I mean, it looks good. So I have performed for people that have been very skeptical and very mm. nervous about the process, particularly when I travel in Africa, because mm. I do that quite a lot. And we haven't seen a lot of Western magic in African culture. Mm. And there's a deep belief of spiritualism and religious magic in Africa still. Yes. So whenever I go perform in Africa, it always becomes a case of just, just, just I'm going to play a joke with you. Yeah. Now. We're going to tell a story. And I make sure that they laugh and react to it in a way that I'm never ever give the indicate never create fear mm. in what it is that I'm performing it's always about creating joy and amazement and wonder so yours is absolutely based on or we can say in general magic is based on the laws of physics all magic's based on the laws of physics all magic all magic even magic that looks to be spiritual is yeah. all laws of physics well physics or all, all mathematics or um, knowing a technique that somebody isn't familiar with but if I if to answer it simply, yeah, physics because that's a, that there's an explanation behind it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that exactly what drives me crazy. But yeah. anyway, then so if you uh, there's an illusionist. Yes. And the, what's the difference? Okay, so magic all and right, so uh, a magician is generally is a general term for people who perform magic. Mm-hmm. All right, a mentalist is the power of the mind magic, mental magic, so mind reading. Um, telling the future, psychokinesis, which is moving objects with your mind, uh, telekinesis, those kinds of demonstrations, Mm. okay? Then you get um, sleight of hand magic, which is typically done with cards and coins and small objects. Mm. Uh, Then we have what I like to call sideshow magic, which is um, more skill-based performance without a rational explanation. So, for example, a colleague of ours came to perform in my theater three weeks ago, and he ate a glass light bulb. Now, it's not quite magic because he literally did it. But, yes. the, but the explanation behind it is in that in that realm of magic thinking where it's like, how did he do that? Yes. You know? Yes. We hammered a, a 12-inch nail up his nose. You know? I mean, that's a, that's a skill set. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily magic, but it's still like in that area of how is that working? Mm-hmm. A little bit of uh, that still amazement in the situation. Uh, an illusionist is typically somebody who performs illusions and the way I ex- describe it is when you start having dancers on a stage and you've got mm. boxes and you've got smoke machines and mirrors and big lighting and all that sort of thing so it's an illusion show typically you could call a small magic trick an illusion and, and you know that's a perfectly reasonable term for a lay person but if you're speaking to a magician and they say I'm an illusionist that typically means that they work with Mm. more than one person in their show and they're using boxes and lights and all that sort of fancy stuff. So more right. theater in that way. So then you've mentioned a few terms here, yeah. like mentalist. Yeah. I mean, what's happening there? If you say, uh, say telekinesis. Yeah. I mean, what's the possible explanation if that's actually what's happening? If no, that's not what's happening. Object. That's what it looks like. All right. Okay. Yeah. So 
many many of the techniques that are used in a demonstration of mentalism oh, so it's a demonstration and, yeah let's let's put it that way it but you know i don't want to break the bubble here but it's not actual mentalism it's mm. a demonstration of mentalism Mental. it's oh, a right. it's a theatrical display and it has to look real mm. otherwise it's kind of stupid right yeah. why would you want to watch somebody that isn't making you convinced it's yeah. like watching a really bad movie yes. you don't want to experience that so but many of the principles that are used in a demonstration of mentalism are the same sleight of hand and trickery that you would see a magician or a sleight of hand artist do or a illusionist do it's mm. just the theme is different mm. so another way to put it um you can film a movie with the same equipment but you can shoot a drama or you can shoot a comedy mm. or you can shoot an action same equipment just different um theme so mm. mentalism is about a theme of mental abilities you know this thing it's it's powerful being a magician you know you think it, so it, i think look a lot of people are making billions or millions of from magic from doing the things that you would do or you do you know i think so you know um i mean it, <laughs> There's a lot of ex- examples on YouTube. Yeah. Like, oh, for folks listening who are not in Africa, this might yeah. sound like out of word, but yeah. it's happening here. There are yeah. a lot of people making money yeah. performing what somebody who does not believe in anything yeah. like myself would yeah. call it magic. Yeah, you know, yeah. because yeah. they can make this thing appear or disappear. Well, I mean, yeah, but if that then you sort of, I think if you're using those the skill sets mm. of a magician in a negative sense. Mm. You're influencing people through fear. Yeah. Uh, you're in- influencing people around money. You're influencing people yeah. around their insecurities. Then I would say that that falls more in the con artist space. Yeah. Because for the most part, most magicians, when you see them on stage, are they're a character on stage, mm. and when they come off stage, they don't demonstrate those abilities in a mm. constant way. Um, whereas a con artist is consistently yeah. making sure that you believe in the story and the character, whether they're on stage yeah. or off stage, or for for their own personal benefit or for the immediate benefit. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know whether they're making billions, but it it, it is. They are billions. They are past a billion. Uh, sure, <laughs> but in a way that's about. Um, it's less about the tricks that they're doing and more about the story that they're telling, the bigger character, the bigger influence. And they just yes. need small demonstrations to, yes. to, to show their powers. But um, it's, it's always going to catch up in the end. I yes. mean, the karma comes around. <laughs> the, the thing is, right, if, if I show you a magic trick mm. as an entertainer yeah, you know, but and I do it badly, yeah. right, and you can see how I do it yeah. and you tell me that you saw how I do it, my first reaction is not to become defensive. My mm. first reaction is to laugh yeah. and go, okay, well, you caught me out there yeah. and we forget about it. Mm. It doesn't really matter, okay? Yeah. But if you're somebody that's conning hundreds mm. and thousands of people and they catch you out, it's not as simple as going, oh, it was just a trick. I was yeah. just joking with you. We're having some fun. It's like a real serious problem. So, oh, yeah, but look, there are people who have come out of those circles and be like, uh, you know, they say they can tell yeah. about your life story sure, and yeah, what you're yeah. struggling with. And there are people that come out and say this thing was, was wrong, was yeah. not right. They would go on YouTube and yeah. make a small video. Well, but I mean, people are it's... so believing in these things because you you call it magic, right? Yeah. In your world, yeah. an honest way of yeah. doing it. They call it miracles, for example. So sure. it, it's a whole different playground. Sure. Right Remember, now. though, that and, and um, miracles are generally things that have been talked about to lots of people. Like, there's a big story around. And then you very rarely know about what actually happened in the actual incident. So, perfect example. This happens fairly often. I'll perform a magic trick in a show. It'll, the audience will be blown away. They won't know how it works. They'll go home and they'll talk about it. And they'll think about it that night. And they'll go back to work the next day and they'll tell their colleagues. And then I'll see that same person a couple of months later and they'll go... I can't believe how you did this and this and this trick and then you did this and then you did that. But what's happened by the time they recall the story to me, mm. they've changed the story to make it even more amazing than yeah. it actually was because they don't tell the the boring parts where I have to do all the work. Yeah. They tell the result of what I'm doing, which is the outcome, which is the trick, which yeah. is the amazing part. Or they tell their family members and their family members go, well, it's impossible that he could have done that. So then we start to reach miracle status, yes. okay? Because there's no way we can go back to see the original incidents and go, mm. yeah, it wasn't really as amazing as you think it was. But yeah. for my purposes as an entertainer, mm. I want them. To, I want them to have the. Ex- 
experience of the miracle level yeah. of amazement. Uh, absolutely. But I don't want them to believe that it is a miracle. Mm. Okay. So I mean, even if we look at um, uh, religious-based miracles, and all religions have got some form of religious-based miracle yeah. in there. Uh, the problem with miracles is that it's very hard, if not darn right impossible, to verify that the actual incident occurred. What you are hearing is a story told on top of a story told on top of a story, and the right. story becomes bigger than the actual incident. Absolutely. And sometimes we've, you know, science has come to the point where we can actually disprove some of the most well-known, um, in inverted commas, miracles. Um, that were uh, performed by various religious and, and spiritual leaders and they can come back now with science and go well this is how this particular thing worked yeah. and people that are utterly convinced and have bought into that particular uh, philosophy religious philosophy have no real incentive to believe the the truth and the reality because they've bought into the yeah, story they're committed hard. to the outcome um, and that, and so for somebody like that who's committed to that being an actual miracle, it's going to be very difficult to try and convince them that there was an actual principle in play with it. Right. Besides, they're going to say, well, how can you prove it? And you go, well, here's the proof. And they go, but that's not what happened in the story. You go, but <laughs> sure, and that's not what happened in the story, but remember the story is, well, a story. Yeah. That's what it is, yeah? But remember, you said earlier, like some guys have come out and said, oh, no, it was all a trick. I mean, Yuri Geller was like that for years. Yuri mm. Geller was an uh, Israeli who became very famous around the world as being a metal bender and a mind reader and all those sort of things. And for years, you go gone to television and radio and perform these, um, I don't want to use the word miracles now. <laughs> Once again, air quotes, miracles. Mm. But, it, you know, t- 10 years ago, he came out and he said to everybody, no, well, I was performing magic, magic. tricks. I was telling a story. Yeah. This was a character. And now, how do you explain to somebody who knows about Yuri Geller but doesn't know the part that he said that it was a magic trick that you've got to go back to him and go, well, actually, right. what, <laughs> he did come out afterwards and say it was all a magic trick. Because their first reaction is going to be, A, you don't want to, we don't like being told that we're wrong. Right. And we don't like to be told about something that we're convinced about, that we're wrong. So if you're convinced that Yuri Geller was real, and you suddenly get told actually it wasn't, you're going to fight the instinct to go, oh, okay, maybe it wasn't. You're going to go, well, no, I'm totally convinced. So conviction is one of those scary things uh, from a uh, human ability point of view, that conviction has the incredible power to allow us to do things um, with pure confidence and pure belief and then uh, but it can also be that negatively where you're so convinced about something that you when the truth gets revealed to you you don't feel um, we don't like to believe truth we don't like looking at evidence and going we were wrong mm. so you know conviction can be it can be a negative thing it can create that kind of process of I refuse to believe the truth even if you show it to me that's actually true because a good example of this would be well I showed that video to yeah. a few uh, you know I remember the video it was David Bla- uh, David Blaine yeah yeah it was David Blaine he was spilling out frogs yeah right? yeah 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 <laughs> uh, in front of Drake and David Chappelle yeah 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 place. I remember this yeah yeah and then you can see that but I think the lack of understanding that this would happen with practice somebody who can achieve that with practice mm-hmm. It, it, it's mm-hmm. like people want to call it, give it a, just because you don't understand. I think most people don't want to admit that they don't know something. They know, they'll just put in them, oh, there's some um, some spiritual something going on there, some dark. Oh, everybody, yeah, I mean, the way you label something like that comes from your prior experience and your reference points. Yes. So if you are not a particularly spiritual person, your reference point isn't to go immediately that that's a miracle or something spiritual. Your mm-hmm. reference point is to go, oh, I don't believe in those kinds of things, so if I don't believe in it, there must be some sort of other explanation. Um, I don't think a magic trick, if you are a, a skeptical person, generally, mm-hmm. that a magic trick is going to make you believe that that's, you know... Uh, miracles or, or magic or uh, spiritualism is real so whereas if you come from a mindset of that spiritualism is real and mm. whatever religion you belong to um, then it's going to be harder to convince you that it's a trick right the other thing about you got to remember with David Blaine is that he's performing magic 
for a television audience in front of live volunteers. But his product, his mm. outcome, the thing he makes an income from is not performing that trick for the, for the individual, mm -hmm. it's from broadcasting that on television, mm. okay? So his tricks are designed to amaze you as somebody sitting at home watching this, okay? Because okay? I perform almost 99.9% oh, .9 of my magic for live audience in front of me, so I don't get the ability to use fancy edits and clever camera tricks or um, change the angle or set up an audience member or anything. Like, I don't have the ability to do that. But if I was going to make a television special, I would make sure that, A, I'm in, uh, amazing the people around me, but I would make a product that looks best for an, a viewing audience. Right, okay? so it's the, the third perspective. Yes. yes. Um, so um, when you watch something like a David Blaine, you've got to remember you're watching on television. I mean, he's proving to you that it isn't a TV trick, mm. but in some way it is. In the same way that um, when we watch reality shows, they're not actually reality. Yes. And if, them, if you go look up online, you'll see what they actually do. I work, with I work in television. Oh, there you so go. So you're very, <laughs> you know, we know that if you go and look up the backstory of what's happening in reality shows, like even things like Survivor, the, they don't show you all the boring parts. Mm. All right. And I think the best way to to explain that is remember when Big Brother was on television? Like you'd watch for a little while and you go, well, most of this is just dull and boring. Yeah. They edit out all the dull and boring bits, and they give you the highlights package. Yeah. So. If, you, if we use the same equivalence there, uh, what you see David Blaine do in a TV special is like the highlights package of a reality show. You only see the best parts. You don't see the parts that don't make sense or don't contribute to the story. That doesn't yeah. make it real. Yeah. That just means that he's doing a really good job in production. Okay, yeah, yeah? As in a television space. Yeah, exactly. Right, and now let's jump into how you got started. Well, I... Um, when I was about nine years old, my mom took me to go and watch a magic show. I think like any young child watching magic shows, it was fun to watch, but it wasn't something that was like, I want to do that. It was just a form of entertainment, like you go watch any children's theater or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then it was school holidays, and she, my mom and I would go to the library quite regularly, and one day she took out a magic book out of the library and came home and she performed one of the tricks out of it. And I looked at her and I went, how on earth are you doing that? Because, mm. you know, I go watch the magic show and the magician does magic. Like, I can understand as a young child, oh, it's the magician who does that. Yeah. But I don't understand that my mom is doing a magic trick. I mean, how on earth is she doing this? Mm. So I was like, how are you doing this? She said, I'm not going to tell you. If you want to learn how to do this, you need to read this magic book. And it's a children's magic book. So mm. it's like big pictures and easy instructions, you know, magic for small hands, that kind of thing. And I learned one trick in there and I performed and I thought, oh, this is quite fun. It's kind of artsy and performancey you got to learn how to you know make the trick and you got to cut it out and you got to practice it and what was what was your very first magic trick oh uh, gee i think it was the three rope trick when you you take one small rope and one middle sized rope and one long rope and you make them all the same length and then you make them all three different lengths again i mean it's so simple a nine-year-old could do it okay? okay um but to me it was like wow i can actually make a grown-up look at this and go like hey that's pretty good i mean i don't know if they were saying hey it's pretty good just because they wanted to make sure build my confidence in saying hey you're doing something amazing well done you and i suspect it may have been in the beginning but by the time i was doing it frequently it was actually a, came to a point where the adults were like no really how are you doing that mm. and that was just because it was exciting and interesting to learn and and went from there into like a paying mm. hobby where I'd make pocket money from performing at shows and restaurants. How old were you at that time? Uh, 12, 13, oh. started performing for money. By 15, I was working in restaurants. Um, after I left school, I decided to go get an IT diploma just to have something to back up. And then I was performing in restaurants six nights a week mm. for almost four years. So when you're performing six nights a week for three hours a night, doing a lot of magic yes. meeting a lot of people yeah so uh, it was just a case of um it's like any uh international you know world number one golfer he goes and hits the driving range frequently and that was kind of like my driving range that was my education into learning magic as something that i could actually entertain an audience with for not just one trick or two trick but i could do 30 40 minutes in a, in a performance right. as one show so yeah, it was something that I started pretty much about nine years old and just was a hobby until about 21, 
somewhere around there, 21, 22, somewhere around there that I decided to go full time into magic and make that my career. So I think there's no such a like a blueprint of how do you make money being a magician or um, making sort of career. What, um, what is your first Well, I can approach? tell you something is that uh, making magic or any performance art a career is quite difficult because uh, art has an intrinsic value, but it doesn't necessarily have an intrinsic financial value, mm. right? Most of the art that gets created is not made for money. It's made as an expression. So, but when using magic as a career, it has to have a sustainable income to make it something that I want to, you know, I can buy a house with and buy a car with, that kind of thing, right? So, um, when we say that there are no blueprints, well, I've got mentors and, and professionals from around the world that have written books on how to create your business in magic and tips and ideas and I've done an international um, training course on how to use magic in the commercial field um, as a kind of live advertising technique and I use that quite a lot now um, so I've had to discover what works as a performer as an entertainer and then how can I create a value a commercial value for what it is that I do and that's kind of the business model that I approach now so it's, it's taking a an art form and an entertainment and finding ways f that my clients can generate attention or interest or story or feedback around that that has a, a benefit to their business mm. right so it's not a case of just performing magic shows for kids which I did do for some years and you're pocketing you know 800 rand 1000 rand whatever it is you've got to do six shows a mm. weekend and that sort of thing um, you know that's that's where I started out, and when I was doing the restaurant, I was getting paid, and the restaurant I was making tips, which was quite fun actually. I could walk out with a couple of hundred rand on a good night. Mm. Uh, now it's it's about being able to translate magic as an art form into magic as a valuable communication technique, yeah. sometimes called entertainment. A good example of that, I think, that I respect you for. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a video on your website. Yeah. Where you, uh, I think it was linked to to a yogurt commercial. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So it was yeah, Pamela. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Presto. Yeah, Presto. Pa Pamela so, Presto. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you went on ETV again, and then yeah, you performed the magic trick. Yes. With a, uh, you bent a fork. It's like a real yeah. So uh, uh, the story is that um, Pamela came out with a with a yogurt called Presto, which was in a little um, uh, disposable uh, tub, yogurt tub, but. You, it was made in such a way that you didn't have to use cutlery to eat it. You just mm. peeled the lid off the tub and then you squeezed the container and all the yogurt would come out. So it's something you could carry in your bag. You didn't have to have a spoon or cutlery with you. Mm. Um, and presto meaning in Italian quick. And Palmolite's an Italian company, so they went for presto quick. The national brand manager went, oh, presto is also magic. So how can we put those two things together, which mm. is where I was called in. And then um, they organized the television sh slot in such a way that I would do my um, metal bending and cutlery bending magic, mm. where I take forks and spoons and they are using, once again, you know, the magic of the power of the mind, the illusion, um, to damage the cutlery and then go, well, but this is fantastic because if you don't have any cutlery left after I've been to your house and damaged all the cutlery, yeah. this yogurt doesn't require it. And then yeah. I demonstrated how the yogurt worked. So what we use there is an entertainment to grab the attention and to have particularly the two presenters in the studio laughing and reacting and then to use that moment of wonder and attention to tell the audience, the target market, yeah. you know, this is what this product is and this is why it's special. I like that. It was, yeah. it was an amazing way so of So it's, it's, um, it's using entertainment as a way of providing information, otherwise known as infotainment. Mm. Right, and that term's been used quite a lot for other different aspects. But I think with magic, it's probably one of the best ways to uh, grab people's attention because it, it is, it's got an, it's got remarkability to it. People have to remark, well, yeah. you know. I mean, I remember that that exactly. moment because of the magic trick, <laughs> yeah. first of all. But I've used it in different ways. Like um, I did a, a national road show with uh, Suntime Insurance, and I was called in um, by the forensic department to do a series of talks for Suntime employees. Um, about um, ethics awareness. Mm -hmm. So I had to, as a magician, mm. explain to them that I'm a kind of a professional liar, all right? Because that, in a lot of 
in the performance character and the theater of it, I have yeah. permission to not be completely truthful in order to make the illusion magical. Yes. Um, and, and that's what I referred to as going, I'm going to fool you and I'm going to lie to you. But ethically, it's OK because we, I'm here to communicate a very important message to you. And I'm going to use it as entertainment to sell the message. Right. So we used all different types of magic tricks to talk about, you know, what ethics is. Why should we be aware, we be aware of it? Um, how does rem reminding people about what ethics is actually statistically lower the number of fraud cases within a company? So there it was literally the brief was use magic to, to make people aware of what ethics is. And it was a very successful show. I mean, we did, uh, it was four days around South Africa and I did 15 presentations of this to the, pretty much the entire Santam insurance group. So once again, that's the me turning an entertainment art form into a valuable communication technique. And it gave the, the client that I was working for, the individual, the ability to have a lot of excitement and energy when people left the talk. And that meant that they remembered the message for longer. So rather than him using a boring presentation and another boring talk and another TEDx video, or whatever it is, mm. he had something that was live and entertaining and yet got the message across. I hope some of the listeners who are artists out there <laughs> learn something from that because, I mean, that's yeah. great. You know, that's well, it's the same way, I think, like a graphic box. designer, you know. I mean, a graphic designer takes a brief and using their creative skills, designs the drawing or the picture or the illustration that tells the person's message. It's, uh, um, you know, if you're a, a studio a session musician, you've got to be able to write music for a particular um, a musician or uh, you're a... Um, television ad designer you know you 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 have an ability to tell a story but with a commercial outcome to that story you're meeting a commercial objective when it comes to then my personal career it makes more sense for me to chase clients and work with clients that want to use what I do for yes. that kind of benefit than purely for the hey shoe wow magic in you know it can be entertaining but it, unless I'm generating value for them right Oh, then it's just going to be something that's it's it's beautiful. It's a moment, but it doesn't have anything th that it attaches to, you know. So, uh, lastly, let's get into the process of creating a magic trick. Oh, cool. Uh, is there a book of magic, and then that you read, and then you just try to, to sorry to practice that magic trick, and then you go out and perform it, or yes, or do you design a magic trick? But first of all, how do you know okay. that it's going to work? Or so the answer the is mental yes. Side of it? Um, but there's not just one book, there are thousands. Oh, okay. And you need to know how to find them, and you need to know where to look. And, and you have to have a deep interest and deep pockets sometimes, because magicians don't give away their secrets cheaply, right? Yeah. So there's a disincentive for anybody who's just trying to lurk about and find that information. They're not going to find it quickly. No, um, that sounds mysterious already. <laughs> well... You don't want to tell people the secrets easily. You want to make them work for it so yeah. they appreciate it. Sure. And that's which is why when I um, purchase a new magic trick from a colleague who designs and creates magic tricks, he charges me a lot of money for it, but he knows, depending on what it is, that I will make that money back by the level of amazement and the stories that I can tell from it and how I can use it commercially. So, you know, for me as a full-time perf uh, performer, it makes sense to invest in those kinds of things. But if you're not a full-time performer, you're not going to spend a couple of thousand rand on, on learning how a trick works if you're not going to use it. Yes. So it's that kind of incentive process on how magic information techniques uh, get shared uh, amongst magicians. So, yeah, it, it was all predominantly books. When I started magic, it was almost all books. There was occasional VHS video here and there. Nowadays, it's becoming a lot easier, so it's mostly video-based teaching. Um, and the, the technology for it's become amazing for magicians because now I can purchase a teaching or a lecture video from a magician in the States like instantly online and download it. It mm. costs me a couple of hundred dollars, but I can. And then I can look at it and apply it into, into my show if, if it fits. Um, so now it's, it's books, DVDs, you buy the props, you put it together... So to answer the second part of your question about whether I design the magic mm. tricks, I don't. But that's me. Mm. All right? I'm not a creator, designer. What I do is I look at a at the wide spectrum of magic that's available commercially for magicians. And then we're talking thousands upon thousands of magic tricks. And, you know, the props or the tricks themselves or the books or the DVDs, there's many, many options, right? But what I do is I choose material that fits my style of 
of performing and fits the character and the story I want to tell in my show. Right. And over the years, I've become very good at at selecting material that fits my needs because I've realized more and more what it is that I do compared to other magicians. So I don't I don't do a lot of mentalism now. In fact, I've tried to take all of it out. I try to base my material on comedy techniques. So there, there are other magicians, however, that do a lot of inventing themselves. So when I say invent, they generally what they do is they take a couple of different techniques and then they apply the techniques in a new way and they design a new way of, of doing those techniques into something new. Uh, to use an analogy for this, um, some musicians might write their own music and they write their own chords and, they, and some maybe they use a lyricist to then writes the words for them or maybe they do it together as a band but they're creating something new other musicians are like cover artists or they remix mm. so they take an existing work and they change it or they adapt it or they perform it either in their own style or in the original artist's style I'm much more of a remixer right. I'm much more of a cover band style so what I do is I, looked at the, I look at the material available, or I look at the material that's existing in my repertoire, and I change the story, or I change the performance, or I change the order in order for me to take this thing that was created, or was something that I purchased or learned, and then demonstrate it in what's best for me and the audience that I perform for. So in, in hip hop also there's kind of a thing if you listen to it where most of the music it's based on samples. Yeah. That means yes. old music yeah. that the artists think it's good. Mm -hmm. They use drum pack of a different yeah. song yeah. and vocals of a different song that they make. I watched one. a very interesting Netflix about the history of hip hop and yeah. they talk the, about the, even the some get of, down? Yeah, 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 yeah. And even some of the riffs in there that it was like riffs from the seventies that still appear in songs because yes. they're very famous mm. beats of music. So yeah, and unless you're familiar with that beat of music, you might think that it's, a, it's an original creation. Mm. Uh, I never s tell an audience that what I'm creating is an original creation. Besides, you would never really know or see it unless you see somebody else perform it exactly the way I perform it, which is why I have the incentive to not perform it the way it came out of the box, okay. right? So the story is, is different. The story is different to the timing or the type of comedy I use. I, I add my own jokes to it. I add my own... Uh, experiences to it so I'm, I'm taking the notes and I'm arranging the notes in a different order for my piece of music in a way or or maybe uh, let's say I'm playing a cover song but I'm changing the instruments all right and if you're not familiar with the original song it sounds like something completely new mm -hmm. regardless I think what I want an audience to to experience and walk away with is a sense of of wonder and joy and amazement from having had this amazing experience yes I don't need them to walk away and go, wow, he did six tricks really well. I mean, oh, that's yeah. what I did, yeah. but that's what I, what I want them to think. Because yes. <laughs> if they notice that, <laughs> then they then I didn't do the show well enough for them to experience the magic yeah. behind yeah. it, yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah, They must talk about one story or two or they directly. To, they're immediately going to talk about the experience. Mm -hmm. Then they might talk about one or two highlights within my particular performance. Mm. They won't remember the whole thing because you can't. I mean, it's the same as stand-up comedy. You, you might remember one joke afterwards. You don't remember the whole set. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay? So it's, it's in that line. But I want them to walk out going, Yo, I just don't understand. That's Something how, happened. That's how I get out of magic yeah. usually. I'm like, yeah. oh, how the hell did it I, 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 I was in um, Uganda about a month ago, and they invited me to perform on a, a, a television station there and uh, in Kampala. And the two presenters were really cool, hip people, like really vibey. And they said, we've never seen magic mm. performed live in Uganda before. And I'm sure once or twice, but it's not something that, that the Ugandans had seen or East Africa have seen regularly, especially my style of Western magic, right. okay, if anything, okay. Um, and gosh, I mean, we had an interview session, match like now, and we recorded that, and then I performed magic for them on camera. Right. And the two of them were... From the moment I did the first piece of magic, they just dropped all pretenses as these sort of celebrity personalities, and they became themselves, and they just reacted <laughs> instinctively and naturally, and they were like, yo, wow, cool. and that to me sold the television experience yes. more to the audience than what it was that I was doing, because they were completely freaking out, not in a negative way at all, they were, they were genuinely surprised by what they were seeing because if these people are on television they have this kind of persona celebrity thing sure. they have to keep which and if oh, they, well, they have to yeah, yeah sure. they have to yeah. yeah and if they have to let that go because yeah. of 
uh, they need to look cool and work. calm and collected and like they know what they're doing so yeah. when they get into a moment where they had no control of the situation yes. and they were experiencing me taking control of it as it was the just performer. them right there. it was just them yeah. in that moment so their humanity came out you yeah. know they were like that suddenly they became real people and that was a good thing to watch. So once again, it's that, it's that experience of, having, of taking people outside of the world that they think that they know into a world that says, actually, you don't know everything. Yeah, it makes, and it was, it we've makes made full circle small. with this conversation, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, huh? yeah. Like we, we don't, I, I don't think we can ever know everything. We can True. get close, but we will never know everything. And that's a good thing because unless we have the uh, imagination and the inspiration and the incentive to discover new things mm -hmm. uh, and discover explanations for how things work, we won't keep discovering new technology. We won't keep discovering new science. We won't keep discovering uh, um, uh, human behavior. If we think we know everything, then we stop looking. Yes. So magic is, is kind of, you know, that, that um, proof. Not really. really. Not really proof, okay? But it... But it the, the magic is not the proof, but the experience of magic is proof that we don't know how everything works yes. and that we should question everything that we see. Just much as movies um, have influenced science, basically, because most sure. of the things that where um, science is going yeah. is based on the movies what, that we wrote in the 80s. Or 90s, yeah, yeah, you know, Space like, Odyssey. You know, yeah. Arthur C. Clarke invented things in his books and they put them into movies, things that we never thought were going to happen. And, and those... That the, the things that looked miraculous then are everyday things to us now. The ideas of GPS um, that came from a movie from science fiction, and now we literally have GPS. Um, robots as well. Yeah, yeah I mean the idea design. of robots, particular yeah. um, uh, the um, the guy who did the Tintin comics. Mm. When he did Tintin goes to the moon, he drew a rough shape for what a rocket would look like, yes. and you know go fly. But the rockets hadn't been developed by then in that way. So he had taken something from his imagination, mm -hmm. and at some point, what somebody said, "Hey, this is a possibility thing, and I'm going to create it," actually became a real thing. Mm. And and it's still based on his initial idea because well, he it, launched an idea. Yes. I mean, he had something. It didn't turn out exactly like yeah. that, but it's um, it's an if you're watching. If you're going to go watch a magic show as a skeptic, then the invitation there is to go away and say, be skeptical further, but you can enjoy skepticism. Mm. If you're going to go and believe that magic is real, you'll probably walk out going, okay, well, that was fun, and maybe I'm believing something, okay? Mm. But if you're going to go and experience a new way of thinking, I mean, we're talking, let's face it, we're all going for the entertainment, okay? But there is that part of us that allows us to walk out of a magic show and go... There's something else out there for us to look for. Yes. And maybe for you and I, it might not be a spiritual thing, yes. but it might be the excitement of, hey, man, if that guy can change money, then what are different ways that we can change money? And we have mm -hmm. got Bitcoin now. It's a yes. whole, f you know, in your mind, logical explanation of what money is. And who knows, in 30, 40 years time, we might be using some sort of um, uh, uh, cryptocurrency every day. Mm -hmm. And if you try and explain it to our parents now, they're going to go, well, that's magic, because oh, yeah. how does that even work? work yeah. Okay. Uh, to, <laughs> to the people listening, actually, who don't understand anything about Bitcoin, there are two episodes. Uh, I think episode 49 as well, and episode whatever in the back, I did something to do with yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, cryptocurrencies. And cryptocurrencies, yeah. yeah. So, finally, lastly, yeah. what for somebody who just want to learn one or two magic tricks for when they go on a yeah. debt, like myself, yeah. I think it'll, it'll help me a lot. <laughs> then I, 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 wouldn't, <laughs> maybe, I, I can I can, I can go there without necessarily ha needing to have money a lot yeah, of money because yeah. I can just make magic. Yeah, if I could do that, would I hang around here? Yeah, uh, I probably would actually. <laughs> um, no, okay, look. So um, there have been. For, I'll, I'll tell you this firstly: magic is a way to um, uh, uh, break the ice mm. for certain. With anyone, I mean that's one of my jobs at co at corporate events is to be a professional icebreaker using magic. So clearly there is value in it, but um, I don't know if it's great for dating and picking up people. That's not <laughs> been my personal experience, and I always wondered when pe when I was using magic to entertain and connect with people if I was getting a flirtatious uh, vibe back again, whether it was because that person was actually interested in me or interested in my magic. So mm. it was a little difficult to tell. Okay, um, but. If you were to go out and learn magic, there's so many p different places to go to, and that's why it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's it's confusing on purpose to make it 
to make you hesitant and not want to find out all the secrets quickly. Okay, oh, so right. it's on purpose, all right? But there is one particular resource that a friend of mine created, and it's really cool because it's a whole website on how to create simple stunts and tricks and gags and little easy magic tricks to connect with people and to break the ice and to meet people and to communicate messages. Mm -hmm. And it's free. And it's got some really cool resources on it. So that's exactly where I'm going to send you. All right. I'll put a link in the the description. Yeah, you put a link there. I don't get anything from it. It's not Mm. my project. I was involved in some part as a a consultant for it for a little while. But when I look at it for the question you asked, it's the best place to go. So it's called coolfidence.com. So like confidence, Mm. but instead of con, it's cool. Right? Coolfidence.com. And you'll find some really cool training videos. It's also really funny to watch. Mm. And they've got some great gags and resources and cool little things that you can do on there to use magic and comedy and humor as a way to connect with people. Right. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of my friend for having put that resource together. And I know he has a big love for magic and using comedy for, for, for communication. So I, I totally go there. So um, just explain as well, share with people yeah. about the Monday nights here. Oh, right. And, and so, how did you end it up here? So um, I uh, own the Cape Town Magic Club. I'm the founder and producer. And we do a show on Monday nights in our seasons called Monday Night Magic. And so I wanted a way for us to have a space for magic in Africa because mm-hmm. there is no other theater dedicated to the art of magic. There is, you will see some magic shows around South Africa, but you will not see a show like ours, which has ma- uh, more, uh, many magicians in it. So at least three, if not four magicians on, in every show. So Monday Night Magic runs over a season. Uh, at the moment we're in season four it'll uh, finish on the 31st of july and then we'll do season five later this year and we do two shows every monday night so we do a seven o'clock show and a nine o'clock show um here in our theater in the secret uh in the basement behind the secret door of the cape town club which is uh quite a prestigious old exclusive members only club uh, on Queen Victoria Street in Cape Town, right in the heart of the city. That's where we are. Right? That's where we are at the moment. So if you've heard the cars in the background, it's because we are looking at Queen Victoria Street and we've got the city sightseeing Cape Town bus going yes. past. Um, so we do a show here. We've got an intimate 50-seater theatre. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've had full houses. Uh, we're full again this Monday night. Both shows are fully booked up. We've had uh, almost all of the best magicians in South Africa performing in our theatre and we've got more coming uh, international guests who come and perform in there in town. Um, it's uh, really is something miraculous and wonder, wonderful uh, that we've finally found a space. We're only we're just over a year old, by the way. It's not even like it's been going for that long. I think we're on show sixty-eight or something like that. Oh. The concept of Mag- Cape Town Magic Club will continue. It has to because mm-hmm. we have never had the opportunity to take magic to the. South African and African public like we have now Mm -hmm. a group of over 20 magicians in a community together to create these shows. So as producer I just heard the cats and I put them together and I create the platform that allows these performers. So whether they are veterans and been performing for 20-30 years already uh, or the juniors that are just coming in. We've got two 19 year olds both of them are award winning and champions in magic. They've both performed overseas um, we've got them performing in our theatre and giving them the experience of performing for a live audience and developing their skills and hopefully get uh, help them get a step in their career in terms of their brand of magic and their personality. So it's not just sell tickets and, and, and take money in. It's actually building the brand of magic and the brand of magicians throughout Africa using our, our theatre as a platform. So it's pretty much like the comedy club here, which we have. Yeah, we pretty much. Have a, a, a sure. Magic club. Well, there's a lot more comedy happening in South Africa than there is magic. So yes. fair yes. enough. You know, it is like that. And then obviously I book my own corporate events, gala dinners, conferences, um, year-end functions, product launches, speaking tours, all those sort of things. So I'm, uh, I'm a specialist in corporate events and conferences. So as the Cape Town Magic Club, 
anybody can contact us for a magician anywhere in Africa to perform for their event. But depending on what the kind of event is, I put four different magicians. So typically when they're looking for a conference magician or, or a conference MC, then those are the ones I take because that's my area of speciality. If they need other events, I have guys in my speci- you know, that have different specialities. Right. But mine is, is going to be you know, corporates, 300 people, gala dinner, awards dinner, that kind of thing. Comedy, entertainment, and uh, magic and MCing. Right. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. That was good fun. Cool, yeah. <laughs> hey, guys and girls. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you learned something from it. If you have something to say to me or Marcel, make sure you put it in the comments. And lastly, remember that you can download each episode uh, from the Grey App Podcast, whether from the website or from SoundCloud or Apple iTunes. That means you don't have to stream it all the time if you have limited internet. You can actually just download it and listen it, listen to it on your own time. So on each episode that I ever did, uh, there is a download button, which must come handy to most of you. And remember, we have a Facebook page now, which I haven't been doing a very good job of telling you about it. But it's there. It's TGA Podcast. Follow us. I post some of the interesting things that I find every day. And uh, I'm also active on Twitter and Instagram these days. Just use the same name, Gray Jabesi. I'm sure you should be able to find me. So I put up Instagram stories uh, and uh, some video posts on there, which you definitely would enjoy if you like the content from the website. So with that, thanks again for listening. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe uh, on grayjabesi.com. There I will be able to send you emails uh, when a new podcast is up. Or if I have a new guest that I think you would like to que- to send some questions, I send you an email say, look, I have this guest coming up. What would you like to ask him? Which is handy considering that I have a number of guests arranged coming up. With that, coming out from Cape Town with love, have an awesome day, evening, or morning. Cheers.